Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. Clyde River is a small and remote Inuit community of 1,100 people in the Northern Territory of Nunavut, Canada, one of the most remote human settlements on Earth. They're battling against a Norwegian consortium of international seismic testing companies and the Canadian government. Seismic testing is a process used to find oil and gas. Huge blasts of air are bounced off the ocean floor. According to many scientists, this causes deafening and death to marine life, forcing them to flee the area. Marine life the people of Clyde River depend on for their survival. The Canadian National Energy Board turned down the community's case to stop the testing in 2014, saying there had been sufficient consultation with the community and that the testing itself was safe. A federal court upheld that decision, so the community is taking the case to the Supreme Court of Canada on November 30th. The consortium of seismic blasting companies have agreed to postpone testing through 2016 as long as the legal process continues. If Clyde River loses in November, the testing will go ahead. Renowned actress and activist Emma Thompson and environmental activist and physicist Chris Williams are in Clyde River and join us from a Greenpeace ship that has just delivered 27 solar panels to the community to show that even in the far north there's an alternative to fossil fuels. Before we get into the legal case and some of those issues, Emma, Emma, you're asked to do all kinds of environmental issues, I am sure, all over the world. Uh, why, why are you in, in Clyde River? Why did you decide this one was so important? Because I went to the Arctic um, two years ago and saw for myself, written into the landscape, the effects of climate change and the environmental devastation that the, our overuse and continued use of fossil fuels has produce it, produced. And I spoke to climatologists and scientists there, and I understood in a very visceral, real way, standing there on melting glaciers, what really was happening at the top of the world and its impact on not only local communities but on the entire world and it seemed to me to take precedence over so many other places where you i mean it's all connected actually paul is the point but the arctic seems to me to be the epicenter of the climate change um catastrophe that we're facing so that's why i decided to come back again and and this issue is is, is the overriding issue is climate change but then there's a specific issue of this search for oil and gas, which obviously if one un believes what almost every scientist on the planet says, climate change is a, 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 even an apocalyptic threat, um, then one sh why would one want to be searching for oil and gas anyway? But this is also an issue of the livelihood of the people of Clyde River. Indeed, absolutely. Well, it's, it's an issue that they're fighting on several fronts. I mean, the battle that we really are up, they're really up against, that we've come to, as it were, stand shoulder to shoulder with them to fight, is this battle about seismic blasting, which is something that I didn't fully understand. Um, and I don't know whether you did, Chris, know exactly what seismic blasting was until I heard a lecture about it here, given by an extraordinary marine biologist who's been studying animals in the underwater for 30 years. She hasn't been underwater, they have. Um, and when I understood what it actually was, I, I, I really began to see what a disastrous um, activity it is. And, and, and the way in which it would affect this community really marks the difference between survival and not surviving. Uh, Chris, so the, the oil and gas industry uh, say that seismic testing is safe. Uh, here's a quote from a 2015 report by the International Association of Geophysical Contractors who work with the oil and gas companies. Uh, they say seismic surveys are generally considered not to be harmful or damaging to the marine environment. Seismic surveys are comparable to many naturally occurring sound sources, are temporary and transitory, and the vast majority are conducted at frequencies below the hearing range, range of many marine species. Um, what do you make of that? The, the, in, in another quote we found, they claim in 30 years of doing this kind of seismic testing, that they can't find a single piece of evidence that any marine life was, was unduly affected. So we know that the oil and gas industry sings from the same playbook as the smoking industry. Not only the same playbook, but they use the same lobbyists and the same research. And they told us for decades 
that smoking was perfectly safe, and now they're telling us that seismic blasting is perfectly safe, I mean, that is contradicted by lots of other evidence. I mean, we should do more research and find out more, but when you think about animals who interact with their environment and each other through the medium of sound, like we do with sight, then it's hard to believe, I mean, just from a common sense perspective, that uh, blasting that is the same magnitude, same order of sound as half a kilogram of dynamite that has to go tens of meters below the surface of the ocean, uh, through the ocean, then through rock, bounce back up to the ship, right, and be strong enough a signal to interpret and analyze for stuff that we shouldn't be looking for in the first place, then I think uh, it stands to reason, and much scientific evidence shows, that actually whales, narwhals, extremely sensitive to sound, will swim away, will change their migration patterns, uh, will alter their reproduction, will uh, alter it, not just whales and other mammals, but also fish, will then get trapped in ice. Um, and so I think it's, it's clear that not only should we not be doing it because the objective is wrong, but it damages uh, sea life directly uh, in ways that we're only beginning to find out in the same way that we've only just started finding out the damage of naval sonar on underwater uh, mammals in the same way. And so it's urgent, actually, to stop all of this, not just before, because it's never been done anywhere near here. Uh, and so this is actually something of a sound sanctuary for uh, underwater mammals, and where, where they're subjected to massive amounts of noise. I mean, these things go off every 10 seconds over a huge area of Baffin Bay, uh, for months on end. Uh, that is the proposal. And it's hard to believe that the mammals who inhabit the underwater world and the ocean could possibly be unaffected by that, the, the scale of uh, noise constantly going off for months on end. And Emma, how dependent are the people of Clyde River on this marine life? Pretty much 100%. This is a community of people who've been living here for thousands of years and whose techniques of of self-sufficient and sustainable um, living methods have, have gone on so long. And they, as soon as the, the, the patterns of these animals change, they will no longer be able to hunt. And when they can't hunt, they don't eat. It's as simple as that. And one of the things that really uh, struck me with a uh, deadly blow was going to the single supermarket in the town here run by a company called Northern where the food prices it was like being in some sort of sci-fi movie I mean a can of coke which we shouldn't be drinking anyway cost six dollars but a tiny little piece of meat really small it's 20 bucks the price is uh, tomato juice 19.99 I mean these are hugely inflated prices for a, a, a community where the median wage is $19,000. So if they can't hunt and bring home what they call country food, which is what they live on, and which is, of course, the healthiest diet they can possibly live on, and there's more to say to that later, if you're interested in food security here, is that there's nothing for them to do. They can't afford those prices. So as, as I say, they are completely dependent on these animals. Uh, Chris, the case before the Supreme Court that the, the community of Clyde River has brought, and uh, on, as I said, on November the 30th, it hinges on whether there was real consultation with the community or not. Um, the National Energy Board decided that there was, there, there was a meeting in the community. Um, wh why isn't that, why wasn't that enough consultation? And, and, I, and I guess I should add to that, uh, in, in terms of what the Canadian government is bound by, and, I'm, and maybe you can explain that too, because I'm not entirely clear what binds them to the issue of consultation. But it is only consultation. They don't have to be in agreement with the community. But start with the first thing. Uh, why, why does the community say there wasn't sufficient consultation? Well, first of all, uh, there were certainly uh, meetings held in, in Clyde River or a meeting, but uh, when questions were asked, to uh, the government officials, to the people, the representatives of the consortium, they couldn't answer any of them. 
None of the slides were in Inuktitut, which is what people predominantly obviously speak here, their own language. Um, the, there was no, uh, any kind of answer to questions of, well, what would the real impact be on whales? What would the real impact be on narwhals, which we hunt? And they said, well, we don't really know. Uh, it was from people there, it seemed less a consultation, and this was reported in the local media, less a consultation and a, a prearranged decision had already been made that this was just rubber stamping uh, a formality without any attempt to actually grapple with the questions that an informed community was then asking because they know the potential and the risk that is involved because this happened in the 1970s. And the older generation uh, in Clyde River remember that they could walk right up to seals or go up on their, on their snowmobiles and the seal wouldn't move because the seals had been deafened uh, by that seismic testing. And so the older generation remembers that and uh, we're trying to find out more information and we're not given any. And so this was really a rubber stamp on the, uh, on the part of the National Energy Board. So yes, we consulted, but it's typical uh, a colonial attitude that goes back hundreds of years that totally dismisses the knowledge and information, how informed local people are about their own environments and saying, well, actually, we've already thought about this, we've experienced it in the past, and now we say no. Uh, and all of the Inuit organizations said no. And so how is that free and informed prior consent, which is what they need uh, now that Canada has signed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People uh, this year, that uh, they are now beholden to. Do they really mean what they their rhetoric espouses, or is it just words? Now, when they mean a, what they say. Well, when the uh, National Energy Board turned this down afterwards, uh, this was also turned down by a federal court of appeal, which is why the Supreme Court is next. Uh, the signing of the indigenous uh, rights at the UN, does that come after the federal court's uh, decision? In, in other words, might this be a, a, there's a kind of a new basis of law that the Supreme Court can look at that the federal court might not have? Well, the, uh, the UN declaration was signed in uh, 2007 by most nations. There were, in fact, only four nations which did not sign it. Guess which ones? Yes, Canada. We know and, that. Yes. Uh, yes, as as well, as, a, as I also I, I have dual citizenship, and as a Canadian, it's uh, it's one of the great mythologies of all righteous, self righteous Canadians that Canada was like almost the only country on earth not to sign this until just recently. So, might yeah, this change so, the way the uh, Supreme Court looks at it, as from the point of the way the Federal Court of Appeal looked at it? It should change it because those decisions were made in 2014 and 2015, and it was in 2016 that Canada formally endorsed the UN Declaration. And Trudeau said yes, uh, that was voted on, and so that should change uh, the legal landscape come November 30th. Of course, Trudeau, after having signed that, has not asked the federal government to back down on this and withdraw the... Uh a permit to do the seismic uh, testing. Well, and, and also, if you read uh, Obama and Trudeau's joint statement on protecting the Arctic that they released in March of this year, you will see enormous amounts of fine words about how to not just protect the Arctic, but specifically uh, preserve the Arctic and preserve the culture of indigenous people for the use of the people who live here. And you can't do that if you drive away all the things that they live off. So um, not only has Canada officially signed the UN Declaration, but Trudeau has signed a joint agreement with the United States to which specifically references the need to consult with and get prior consent from the indigenous community in order that they continue can continue with their culture and livelihood and so on. So uh, there are multiple ways in which the Supreme Court needs to look at the legal obligations and the political standpoint of the Canadian government. Emma, how much media attention is this getting back home, back home for you? 
Um, well, we haven't got, gone home yet, so we'll be coming to Toronto. We're still here, so we'll be going to Toronto first. We haven't been off signal on offline, so we haven't been able to do much in terms of media yet. So we're building our knowledge. I mean, this is my first time with a, um, as it were, I've been to the the, the, the landscape itself, but this is the human landscape I'm visiting for the first time. And so I have a lot to learn And before I start spouting, as it were. Um, and I feel as though I'm, I, I'm learning so much about how this extraordinary, very small community lives and how desperately it's been affected by colonialism and how it is now possible for them to make a stand not only for themselves but for all of us in relation to the the urgent the urgent necessity to protect the arctic from more drilling i mean you know the the ultimate irony for me is that here we are in a place where the ice is melting. We've seen uh, we went to a fjord yesterday where these great huge towering cliffs are naked, there's no ice at all. And our Inuit leader, Jerry Natanin, he said, you know, when I came here when I was a little boy, the ice would be hanging down. And these all these cliffs haven't seen the light of day since the last ice age. So you're looking at something magnificent that is also tragic because you know it means that this new ocean that we have caused to happen at the top of the world is something that we can't do anything about. We have to, um, we have to act to protect and make the Arctic a global commons. So that's why it's it's a community issue, but it's also a global issue. Emma, Chris, thanks very much for joining us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.